In this video, we're going to be doing some limit practice problems. Right? So this is going to be a three-part series just because there's a lot of things I want to cover. One video would be a little too long. So in today's video, we're going to be doing some common zero over zero limits, a couple of things. It's going to be pretty wide, but it's going to cover a lot of little, little um, concepts that you should know. Next thing we're going to do is going to, we're going to do limits at infinity. And then we'll talk about the squeeze theorem a little bit. We'll do some limits with squeeze theorem. Uh, this one is not as common, but it's still, still good to know because there are some places where you might uh, might see a limit that requires a squeeze theorem. Okay? So that's basically where, where we're going. Okay? So a couple of notes before we start actually solving the questions. So firstly, uh, you might ask how to best use this video. Okay? Here are my suggestions. Firstly, try each problem yourself and then check to see if you got it right. So again, the whole goal behind me making these videos is not just for you to like sit and necessarily just like watch them through like many times, it's to give you some practice, right? So you have something you can actually, uh, you know, sit down, try and work through yourself and have some, uh, some help for, them, right? So if you get the questions right, that's fantastic. If not, watch my explanation, yeah? Watch it through. I, I'm trying to make it as thorough as possible so that you can really follow my mindset, follow every intricacy of what you need to do to solve each of these questions uh, and make sure you understand how to solve the question right so what i would recommend doing is even if you have some time try solving the question again after watching the explanation right or then maybe try a similar question that you might have covered in your notes or homework anything right also we'll have a table of contents in the description so this is again if you find if maybe there's some questions in this video that you've already covered at length so you're really good at you don't necessarily need any other help on those Power to you. Skip to you can skip to some later examples that maybe you haven't seen before, and you might need a little bit more practice with. Yeah. So I've got a table of contents in the description. Should also be in the time or this video here, at the bottom of your screen. So you're welcome to skip around, see what you might find useful, and uh, yeah, just really make the most of this video that you can. Right. So yeah, with that, let's go ahead and solve some limit questions. All right. So here's our first examples here. So the first one here, we've got this rational function here, and we're taking the limit as x approaches. 5. So right off the bat, if you try plugging in 5, which I highly recommend you try, you'll end up getting 0 over 0. Right? Now if we get 0 over 0, we, that's going to be the case in all of these questions, that suggests that we need to do a little bit more work, and that we can actually get a finite answer, but we need to do a little bit more work to get there. Right? So let's see what we might be able to do. So notice up here we have a quadratic. right? A quadratic. So given that, we could maybe try factoring it and see if that does anything. Right? So let's go ahead and try that. So we would now have the limit as x approaches 5. So the denominator is not going to change. We'll still have that x minus 5 there. But in the top here, x squared minus 10x plus 25. Again, we're thinking of two numbers. Add to minus 10 and multiply to be plus 25. Well, it's going to be x minus 5 times x minus 5. So if we factor that, what we'll end up getting is actually just going to be x minus 5, the whole quantity squared. And if you want to check that this is, in fact, the right, um, right factors, foil this out, and you will get that same uh, quadratic up there. Okay. Now that we have this, look what happens. This x minus 5 and one of these x minus 5s in the numerator cancel out. Right? So what we'll be left with is we're going to have now we'll have the limit as x approaches 5 of just x minus 5. That's pretty cool, right? And now we no longer have that 0 over 0 situation, so we can just plug in 5, and we're going to get our answer is just going to be 0. right? Because again, we eliminated this denominator, so we don't have that dividing by 0 problem anymore, so we can just plug in 5 now and we get 0. Cool. So, all right, so next question. So as you can see, this looks a little bit messier, right? Because we have a cubic term here and a lot of different uh, lot of different things going on here, right? But once again, since that's a polynomial over a polynomial, why don't we try factoring, right? Let's see what, that, what we could do. So up here, notice that all these terms in the numerator have a common factor of x. Likewise, all these terms in the denominator also have a common factor of x. So we can rewrite this as the limit as x goes to 0 of, we factor out an x in the numerator, and then we'll have x squared minus 
3x plus 4 all over again we'll have an x right times x minus 1 yeah and now this guy and this guy will cancel and so what we'll be left with is just going to be the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared minus 3x plus 4 over x minus 1. Okay. Now you may wonder, do we need to factor this out again? And you could. It's not, it's not, it's not, not wrong. It's not wrong. But do we need to? Right? Because remember, the only reason we needed to factor we needed to factor over here was because if we plugged in zero, we get a zero in our denominator. We no longer get a zero in the denominator. Right? So we can go right ahead and just plug in our zero and evaluate our limit right away. Right? So if we do this, right, we're gonna get zero squared minus three times zero plus four over zero minus one. And so all of these just go away, so we're just left with 4 over minus 1, which is just going to be minus 4. That right there would be our final answer. Right? Awesome. So that's, basic, that's our first two examples. All right, question 3. So we have this rational function again, uh, but this time we have the added complexity. We have a square root in the denominator there. Right? Once again, this is a 0 over 0 situation. If you plug in 0, we get zero in the numerator, zero in the denominator. So we know we can we can definitely do something to clean this up, but we can't quite do what we did in the previous examples, right? Because we don't have a nice quadratic or a nice polynomial that we can factor things out of. So we can't factor, but there's something else we could do here, right? Because notice we have a square root minus something. So we could actually try something called multiplying by a conjugate, right? So let's try multiplying by a conjugate. So what that would look like is like this. So we'll have the limit as x approaches 0, 3x, square root of x plus 25, minus 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply it by the conjugate of this very annoying term in the denominator here. Right? So we're going to multiply by square root of x plus 25 plus 5 over square root of x plus 25 plus 5. Okay. Why this specific quantity? Uh, you'll see in just a second. Right? But notice here though that I'm not actually changing the value of this expression. right? This Because this thing effectively is like multiplying by 1. Because I'm multiplying by the same thing in the numerator and the denominator. It's effectively multiplying by 1, so I'm not actually doing anything illegal. Right? I'm still just multiplying by 1, making this look just a little bit different so I can uh, achieve the desired result. Okay? So let's multiply this through and see what we get. So we're going to have the limit as x approaches 0 of the numerator is not super remarkable. It's just 3x times what we have there. So we'll have square root of x plus 25. 5. Be careful with your parentheses there, because that's important. But in the denominator, we have something a lot more interesting. So you might remember this identity that you might have learned in pre-calc or something, that a minus a squared minus b squared, a difference of squares is the same thing as a plus b times a minus b. Right? You might remember difference of squares. Right? That's the formula. Look what we have here. a minus b, a plus b. Right? So we can invoke this identity down here right? and rewrite this denominator as a difference of squares. Right? So suddenly we can change this all into, um, let's, let's do that in green. So we'll have a squared, which is going to be this square root of x plus 25 squared, minus 5 squared. And this is the whole reason we multiply by this particular thing, right? 
this conjugate here. This is the whole purpose of multiplying by the conjugate. It's engineered to specifically bring about this kind of result. Okay, awesome. So now let's see what we get next. So we can go ahead, let's go ahead and simplify this denominator a little bit more and see what comes out. So the numerator is still largely unaffected at this point. So we have 3x, actually we have to carry our limit over. So we'll have the limit as x goes to 0 of uh, we'll have 3x, uh, we'll have square root of x plus 25 plus 5 over x plus 25 squared is the square root of x plus 25 squared, well the square root and the squared cancel, so we're just left with a plus x plus 25, minus 5 squared, which is 25, and now this plus 25 and this minus 25 both cancel out. And so all we're left with the denominator is this one x term here. And now notice this x term and that x term now cancel out. Right? So what we're left with at the end of all this is just going to be the limit as x goes to 0 of 3 square root x plus 25 plus 5 over 1, basically. Right? And now I no longer have that trouble in the denominator, so I can just go ahead and plug in my 0. Right? I can plug in, take my limit, plug in 0. Okay? And so if I do that, what I'm going to end up with is I will have plugging in 0 into this will just be the square root of 25, which is 5. So we'll have 3 times 5 plus 5. 5 plus 5 is, of course, 10. So my final answer is just going to be 30. Awesome. Okay. Cool. So that's how we take these limits using a conjugate. Let's apply the same thing over here. Right. So once again, we have that square root over there. So and with this is a 0 over 0 limit. So let's say we can get uh, get rid of that square root using a conjugate once again. Right? So this is going to be, we're going to multiply by the conjugate again. So we're going to multiply by square root of x plus 9 plus 3 over square root of x plus 9 plus 3. Okay? Multiply that out. So then what we're going to get is we'll have the limit as x goes to 0 of uh, the denominator. Let's do that one first. We'll have 2x times this, this piece here. So we'll have square root of x plus 9 plus 3. Okay. And the numerator, once again, we can apply our difference of squares. Right? We can apply this formula here. So we're going to have... Um, we can go straight over here. We'll have x plus 9 minus 9. Okay. And once again, this guy here is our 3 squared. This guy here is our square root of x plus 9 whole quantity squared. Okay? Cool. So once again, this guy this guy cancel out. Once again, we just have an x in the numerator here. That's going to cancel out with this x here, right? And so all we're going to be left with is we'll have the limit as x approaches 0 of, just have a 1 in the numerator, 2 times square root of x plus 9 plus 3. Okay, and now once again, I no longer have the problem with a zero in my denominator. I can plug in the zero there. I will get uh, square root of. If I plug in this, if I plug in the zero, I will end up getting one over two times square root of nine is just three. So I'll get three plus three. That's going to be six. So my final answer is just going to be one twelfth. Sweet. And that's, that's another conjugate, multiplying by conjugate example.
All right, questions five and six here. So here we have the limit of x goes to zero of x minus seven, the whole thing squared, minus 49. So once again, in this situation, we will still get a zero over zero limit. And there's nothing else, not, none of the previous techniques really work here, right? Because we can't really factor anything out because this has already kind of been factored as much as we can. Um, there's no square root, so conjugate doesn't really help us. So what could we do then? Well, that we've got that we've got this kind of factor here, right? We've got x minus seven the whole quantity squared. Why don't we foil that out? Let's see what happens if we foil that out, right? So, what we'll get is we'll have the limit as x goes to zero. Um, you can foil that out using whatever method you choose, uh, but what what you'll end up with is we'll have um, x squared minus 14x plus 49, okay, let's extend that a bit, minus 49, yeah, and we're dividing all that by x, okay, now, notice, we have a plus 49 here, minus 49 here, both those are just going to cancel, so what we'll be left with is we're going to have the limit as x goes to 0 of uh, what we've got left here. So we'll have, let me just keep them black. So we'll have x squared minus 14 times x over x. And unfortunately now, when we plug in 0, we still get that 0 over 0 limit, right? We still have that problem because we're dividing by 0. How could we get rid of it though? Well. Why don't we try factoring now? Because now that this guy right here in the numerator, that's a quadratic. That's something we could try factoring. Right? And we can notice that both of these terms have a common factor of x. Let's try factoring that out. Right? So what we'll have now is we'll have the limit as x goes to 0 of factor of that x. So we'll have x minus 14 over x. And now this x and that x cancel. And so what we'll end up end up with is we'll have the limit as x goes to 0 of x minus 14. And now we can just comfortably plug in our 0, take our limit. We can take our limit by plugging in 0. And our final answer is just going to be minus 14. Awesome. So this is the kind of thing you might see a lot in definition of the derivative problems. Um, but yeah, I have, a, I have a video on those if you want to check those out as well. Okay. They're all still limit questions. All right, question six. So as you can see, we have an absolute value there. Now, whenever I say an absolute value, I like to break it up into a piecewise function, right? Because absolute value functions can get a little bit tricky to deal with. Piecewise functions are a little bit more straightforward. Right? So let's break this up. So we can take, we're taking the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this uh, piecewise function here. So, so whenever we break up an absolute value function to a piecewise function, we make that break at the center of the absolute value function. In this case, that would be 3, right? because it's x minus 3. So we're going to make that break at x equals 3. So we'll consider what happens. We'll define this separately for values of x greater than 3 and separately for values of x less than 3. And we don't consider 3 because it's undefined there. Sweet. So now let's see what goes in each part. So for values of x greater than 3, it's going to be the positive of whatever is under that, under that uh, absolute value sign. right? So it's just going to be positive x minus 3 over x minus 3. For values of x less than 3, it's going to be the negative of what's under whatever is under that uh, absolute value sign absolute value function. So that's going to be negative x minus 3 divided by x minus 3. Be very careful about your parentheses here and the way you put that negative sign there uh, because I've seen a lot of people mess that up. Right? So that's that. And now we want to take the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this guy. Right? So if we're taking the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, it means we're only interested in the values of x to the left of 3, 
So we're going to only consider this branch here, right? Because we're only interested in the values less than three. So we do that, we'll get, we're going to get the limit as x approaches three from the left of, maybe we'll call that f of x. This is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this guy over here, which is going to be negative x minus 3 over x minus 3, which is actually just mm, minus 1. Because right? this, this, this just simplifies down to minus 1. This guy just simplifies down to plus 1. Right? So this is just really going to be the limit, oops, that's bad notation, it just be the limit as x goes to 3, my apologies. Limit as x approaches 3 of minus 1, which is just going to be minus 1. Okay? Fantastic. Pop quiz, though. My question to you now is, what is the limit as x approaches 3 of this quantity here? What would that come out to? Take a second and see if we can figure it out. Well, the answer is actually that this quantity does not exist. Why? Well, to the left of 3, f of x takes f of x takes on this value, right? The limit as x approaches 3 from the left is this value, negative 1. However, as you approach 3 from the right, it would be a positive 1. Right? You can work that out as well. It's going to be a positive one. Yeah? So basically, this limit would not exist because the right and left hand limits just do not align with each other. And therefore, the limit itself cannot exist. Right? So this limit would not exist. Cool. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and check out some other videos. See you next time.